that Travis Corcoran guy um, who wrote Escape from Cities, I've read through his book a bit and to say I've paged through it and gotten a feel for it. He's telling you how to build a homestead. He's not telling you how to think about building a homestead. And I think that's a big disservice. Uh, a lot of particulars is not good. Any, any engineer that focuses on the solution and not on the problem is not an engineer worth their salt. You'd spend 90% of your time defining your problem and then about 10% of your time defining the solution, which is the design, the thing you're building, right? So how do engineers think? All right, so engineering philosophy. I'm gonna give you 8,000 years of engineering history in one slide. So I, I'm an engineering physicist, right? I, I did physics as well as engineering. Uh, the type of engineering this is, is, is like what kind of engineer you'd need to be to build scientific experiments. So if I wanna build like a graviton collector, or sorry, graviton detector, um, or something like that, or a, a Langmuir probe to go into space, all that stuff, you kind of need to know the engineering as well as the science to do it. So I kind of straddled both of them. And the conclusion I came to is that science is great, but science is hyper overrated. Engineering is is like the Chad, you know, virgin scientist versus Chad engineer. Because Chad engineers have been doing this for 8,000 years. That's as old as the pyramids are. The pyramids are a great example of engineering. Engineer versus scientist. Scientists were saying that, oh, it's impossible for heavier than air flight. And then like two bicycle mechanics within the span of five years were doing heavier than air flight. You know, hold my beer. It's been a discipline far longer than science has been, and it has a methodology. First thing you wanna do is burn off your dead wood. What this means is remove things that you don't need. That's what that mission statement is for. You want a strong and simple mission. Once you have that strong and simple mission, you actually derive that down to requirements. So let's say your strong mission is, I wanna be food self-sufficient. Well, the next thing I would do is a nutritional analysis to figure out what does that mean to be food self-sufficient? What do I need to actually grow? Okay. I haven't seen a single homesteader actually do that. Not yet. Maybe, maybe somebody has and I haven't noticed them, um, but I've hit all the big hits and they don't talk about, they haven't done like a full nutritional analysis. That would be step number one for me when it was. Next thing is rational risk management. So having perfect measurements and having perfect circumstances are great. That's why hindsight is 2020 because it's already happened. Making decisions means that you're doing it on a timeline. And if you're doing it on a timeline, that means you have to accept a certain amount of risk. You can roughly estimate it as impact times probability. Now, you also have to have a balanced approach of research versus testing versus calculation. There is a ton of research you can do on doing a homestead, but there is a such thing as way too much research. And I've noticed that way too much research is, is really bad for you. It's better to actually kind of get there and get a bit dirty. And all this culminates in better is the enemy of done not the inability to really separate wants from needs, the inability to really handle risk, and the inability to balance research and action results in this procrastination. You know, better is the end of, they're trying to make things better. I'm trying to make the product better. I'm trying to make the risks better. I'm trying to make, you know, trying to do more research. Uh, better is the enemy of done. Sometimes you just gotta get in there and get it done. All right, so you gotta get something working before you make it better. In other words, you have a, you have a staging to it. Next slide, please. This is the engineering cycle. So this is what every systems engineer is going to see in, in school. And they're gonna repeat over and over again as a mantra every year they work in the industry. You start out pretty much as a thought. Concept of operations just means the mission statement. Requirements in architecture, that's the beginning of the design, right? You're starting to define what your problem is. Detailed design is when you're starting to actually put some blueprints together. Implementation is when you're building things. And everything on that right really is about putting stuff together, seeing if it works. I'm just gonna really rough over it, right? And you're gonna go back at the very end of it, you're gonna go back to that top left through verification and validation. What that means is you're gonna check it. Does this actually meet our needs? And then just keep repeating until it's good enough. If you're doing this right, you'll actually start to do an inward spiral towards where you're supposed to be, right? It, building products is a lot like using a mortar to try and hit an enemy. You're gonna be over target, then you're gonna be under target, and then you're gonna be right on target. That's ideally what you gotta do. But that means you're gonna fail twice before you succeed, at least twice. And that's assuming that you know conditions don't change. This is why action is so important because you can sit here and do all the wind calculations you want, but at the end of the day, you need to launch that mortar and see where it lands. All right, next slide. All right, so these, these culminate in rookie mistakes. So hoarding, I need everything. There's no prioritization, and I call this the consumer's folly. It's when you add all the bells and whistles. I need it, 
I don't know, you, you tell you, you think about your homestead and you're like immediately oh i need a smoker okay no it needs to be a vertical smoker I, I think i like charcoal and it's like do you need a smoker at all like did you ask that question right uh i need to i need my hunting gear i need all my hunting gear and have you considered another source of that meat right you weren't thinking about the meat you were maybe thinking about the hunting part all right you're, you're maybe thinking that you need these comforts that you don't actually need the second one is frozen in fear if you can't manage risk and especially if you're not willing to fail you're going to be frozen in fear and you're going to have neuroticism neuroticism's folly and then of course you have the perpetual researching and no action i call this the academics folly because i find the more educated you are the more this happens to you and i had to really break myself from this so now i just i just shotgun things i just try stuff out at the same time as i'm reading right so i'll do the research but it's like you have to pace it and then all these things culminate in escalation 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 you're always shooting for better you're always moving targets if anybody ever says hey wouldn't it be awesome if we if the next words out of their mouth is finish our original mission as stated you can give them a slap in the face if you adding more things is going to make you crazy better is the enemy of done always say that if you come away from this presentation with any anything branded to the inside of your cerebral cortex i hope it's that better is the enemy of done and it is a culmination of, of all three from above all right next slide please so solving these rookie mistakes so how do you fix this i was on a phone call with another lo uh, brother and it kind of hit me as like hey maybe try going out camping bring as little as possible you know if you have a if you have a family or a big family you can actually rent out cabins and they're pretty spartan first off you're going to get away from the technology and that's really important second off you're going to find out what you actually need okay did you did you actually need those uh, chafing dishes and that portable pot stove you know it turns out you know we just made a fire in a campfire ring it was no problem you know did you need the solo stove you know did you need this did you actually need that you know it turns out maybe all the water stuff was really important and i'm going to talk about in this presentation why water is the, the most important thing uh do a fast so i know that jack and uh, a lot of other people have suggested doing a fast doing a fast is actually really really good for knowing what you need um that fat alex you saw on uh, the left side of that previous slide there he he started doing fasts and he found out what an actually <laughs> appropriate sized portion was. Once you deprive yourself a little bit, you're gonna get some perspective. And you're gonna realize that you don't actually need all this stuff. Okay, so you're gonna, I suggest you to get past these other rookie mistakes you need to start and do something, fail early and often. So instead of just reading a book on, I don't know, let's say herb gardening, herb gardening, sorry. Start an herb garden. What's the worst that happens? Some of them fail, some of them die. Uh, my approach on my homestead is I try growing it, and then if I have problems, I'll reference stuff. The only things I found out that you really shouldn't ever mess with is if you ever see pests, go ham on killing all the pests. Don't, like, pests are like a cancer. You give them, you see them one day, and then three days later, all your all your crops are dead. So don't mess with pests. But other than that, you can kind of just see what sticks. Uh, I found out that there are varieties of tomatoes that are actually way easier to survive. Uh, there are ones that are prone to splitting. There's ones that are prone to rot that are prone to disease. I found out that uh, growing potatoes isn't as easy as it looks. That sort of stuff. You, you fail early, you fail often. And you're gonna find out stuff that's aren't, that aren't in any of the books. You're also gonna find out that some of the concerns that are in the books aren't actually concerns. All right, you're not building a moon rocket. No astronauts are gonna die and burn up in the atmosphere if you screw this up. So keep doing it, keep failing. You know, bite off a little more than you can chew. You can always spit out some later. I did, like, for example, I abandoned a couple of crops. I started them and I was like, you know, I don't have time for this. And then I just didn't really care anymore. But it's okay. So you have to walk before you know how to get a guide. That's me. If you want me to, if you want to run anything by me, feel free. All right, next slide. Needs versus wants. So it depends on your risk assessment, right? Like this person who bought a millstone probably thought, hey, if the first off, they probably thought it was pretty cool. I mean, I'm looking at that and that's pretty cool. It's a 30 inch millstone. It's a piece of art, really. It's a piece of artisanship. Uh, they also might think the world might really come to an end, right? Their risk assessment is different from mine. That's fine. You're a sovereign person. So that piece of real estate between your ears is different from the from mine. Therefore, your concerns are going to be different. But you do need to balance this approach. So taking a look at these uh, things, millstone is about $2,250. Do you want to buy just 25 pounds of flour versus just buying the uh, small grain attachment, right? You're your solution is going to be dependent on the mission that you've defined for yourself and your risk assessment and all that stuff. So what is your stuff hits the fan scenario? 
My most common one is losing my job or seeing a major finan major financial burden, All right? It's also supply chain breakdown, shortages, and rising expense. Post-apocalyptic LARPing is fun. That's the, I don't want to take any risks ever approach, but it's very expensive. It's very expensive and you might not need it. I mean, I've considered if I need to learn how to make my own biodiesel and it just seems so out of the realm of normality that it might be a thing I learn how to do just for fun, but I don't know if I'd ever count on it. Even the most impoverished areas of the world have access to, to diesel. In my risk assessment, it's not worth it. Maybe yours is different, that's okay. All right, next slide, please. This is what actually makes a, a homestead practical now. Uh, maybe when I first bought my homestead, I wouldn't have said this, but now I am. Uh, the projected cost of a good is based on its current trend line, right? So if you take the last 30 years of food prices and you make a trend line, you're gonna get a certain projected cost. Well, once you start throwing in additional risk there that we've never seen before, such as the situation you've seen right now, the projected cost has a plus or minus value to it, right? It could be $7 for that bit of flour on the, on the previous slide. And then next year, what's the price gonna be? I mean, we don't know. It could be $9, $20, who knows? So as these projected costs start to go up, it actually starts making financial sense. Right now we have scarcity, supply and demand, regulation, transportation, unstable dollar. Situation is looking pretty effed right now. It's really effed. Uh, and I think it's gonna probably get worse for a while. It may not get better, I don't know. Homesteading for me was the best way to weather the storm. You know, my, my catchphrase is farmland is the new Bitcoin. It eases food costs, it does not eliminate it. Anybody that says they're gonna eliminate food costs entirely is, uh, is is crazy, but take a look at this dollar right next to here. There's farm production on the left and food processing just next to that. So farm production is 7.6 cents per dollar spent uh, for the average dollar uh, by food industry group. Then food processing is about 14.7 cents, All right? So food production would be, or farm production might be, this is how much hay it takes to feed this cow. The processing is how much does it cost to actually slaughter this cow? But look at everything to the right of that. Okay, there's packaging, 2.3 cents. Transportation, okay, transportation. Wholesale trade, all right. Wait, retail trade, wait, what's that? Food service is 38 cents. Food services means restaurants. Energy is 4.1 cents. Financing and insurance is three cents. Advertising, two point, you get the idea, right? I would, about less than 30% of the food expenditure actually comes from production. So if you wanna cut out 70% of the expenses, you can just go local. Like I just bought an entire cow. This wasn't wasn't too difficult. I just cut off 70 cents, 70% 70 of that food expense by just finding a farmer on Craigslist who was gonna sell me a, a, a cow and have it slaughtered for me. Um, <clears throat> so my homestead is a cost reduction measure. Some people are gonna use it as a, the world is ending and we're facing nuclear annihilation or something like that. That's fine if that's a risk assessment. I don't criticize that. It's just not my risk assessment. All right, so how do you identify these needs, All right? So now that we've identified our mission, and we've identified some risks. Now let's talk about needs. You wanna track consumption, right? Again, like my losing weight analogy, I just started tracking my, my calories. It wasn't really rocket science beyond that. If you don't measure things, you don't know what they are. How You can't possibly improve a metric that you're not measuring. It's like trying to improve your lap time without actually timing yourself on the track. And I would also tell you to look to other places. A lot of homesteaders start looking to the past and this might trigger some people who are on here, I don't know, I apologize if it does, but if you look towards the past and you think Little House on the Prairie is gonna be the solution for your homesteading life, I don't I don't think that's very useful. Um, that was then and this is now. Times are the biggest change that happened, right? Because time is tracked with technology. Also, the, the survival rate back then wasn't really great. I don't think that's anything worth emulating, right? But, but you can look at these canaries in the coal mines, these other areas that are affected before you. I mean, all of us look at California and New York for one reason, is because they're the first one to experience something, if something happens, right? Whether it's culture or whether it's crime or whether it's something else. I mean, even the most impoverished farmers I see around the world are using gas and diesel. I've, I've seen it, it's just more expensive, which is why they use motorcycles and scooters to do everything, All right? They don't use a lot of pickup trucks. I actually stubbornly am refusing to buy a pickup truck until I, I absolutely need one. Just doesn't wanna see how far I can stretch my subcompact hatchback Honda Fit. Because I don't want to buy stuff I don't need. That's that's consumerism. That's con that's very expensive. I'm going to try to make this thing work. I'm going to look at the way other people are doing it now. Uh, I might look at countries. I put countries slash states because I moved to Tennessee because if the United States is going to slide into a third world country, I might as well go to the state that has the most experience with that kind of living. 
and I, I'm not wrong. <laughs> I, I've got a I've got a, a neighbor who was able to build a barn for 250 bucks that houses like a dozen meat goats. Each one of those goats is a thousand dollars when he sells it. Guy's a genius. He's also been a farmer for like 71 years and is a Vietnam vet. And he tells me all sorts of ways I can just save money and make things easy. You know, look look around at other people. Don't try try to look at the past because the past is also difficult. I can't go and interview someone on the Great Frontier. But I can just go talk to, I can get on a Zoom call probably and actually talk to someone who's in Thailand. And your needs are going to be based on part on risks, right? Before we made those risk assessments. So if you need extra stuff to stockpile, maybe you feel there's a risk of a hurricane or some disaster or, you know, you going, getting laid off. So your needs are affected by your risks. All right. So a rational risk assessment. I mean, having a rational risk assessment is about as rare as a unicorn. And I would say that even for my own risk assessments, it's, it's an art. Unfortunately, it's an art. When I said that impact times probability is an estimate, that's the very loosest estimate. It's literally we have two numbers that have anything to do with risk, like how likely is it to happen versus how hard is it going to happen, hit if it does happen, and then you just multiply them together. And then we all shrugged and said, well, that's about as good as we can do. But really, it's it's going to be an art. So what I want you to do, one of your homework assignments, which I can follow up with this uh, to the RSVP list and, and send this out, but write this down. You want to write down all the risks that you feel like you're going to face. Global, personal, any risk that you feel that, that that's keeping you up at night, right? The thing that you want to address. I'm trying to make the list too long, but I totally understand if it's a long list, right? It may, <laughs> it may be a thing you bring into your therapist someday, who knows? But then rank them, right? In terms of impact and then in terms of probability. Just, just a one through 10. One being the least impact, 10 being the most. One being the least probability, 10 being the most. And just get a sort of a picture of, of what you think is actually going to be a problem. Because I guarantee you won't be able to hit every single risk. Just like you can't build a house that's 100% burglar proof. My ideal thing for burglar proof houses is just buy a house in a place that nobody is in the middle of nowhere. Works pretty well. Uh, sometimes you make things a non-issue. All right. So, but you're, I'm kind of jumping to the first bullet point now though. You're a sovereign man. Your job is to manage the risk for your family. If you do too much of this risk mitigation, you're gonna turn your entire family into a bunch of prisoners. I've seen that happen, it's not good. If you do too little risk mitigation, you're putting them in extreme danger. So leaders are all about making uncertain calls during uncertain times. They're not about having the perfect calls. It is what it is. That's why you write these things down in that list I was telling you about and you rank them. And you may be able to start getting your arm around what's going on. And that list is going to change, right? I wouldn't have thought the supply chain was really as bad as it was until about a month ago. Times change. All right, balancing action with research. You need to limit your amount of research by what direction things are going to go, right? Direction is in globally direction. I did enough research to know that food prices are going to get really high. And then your research is going to be about informing your immediate actions. So I've got this great book series grow great vegetables. This one's in Tennessee. It's not for every state, right? But it might be for your state. It actually tells you what to do every month. This is perfect. In fact, if you, even if you don't live in the state, buy the book or look to like, buy the book and look at its structure because you should write this for yourself. What you do is you pop your head up above the clouds. You get a good ground truth. You take a look around, then you put your head back down on the grindstone and just focus on what you're supposed to be doing that day. That way, most of your brain is focused on action. And then once in a while, you perk your head up and you get yourself a global picture so you can get back to the action. Everything's about the action. So this book that my real estate agent actually bought me has a month by month of exactly what you have to do per your farm. And then it has a breakdown of every major vegetable group and what you're supposed to do for that. And it's like a one pager for each vegetable. And honestly, I found it to be more than sufficient and explaining what to do. Uh, the only thing that other book that I have is a book on diseases. So I can go out and identify diseases and then react accordingly. Uh, did you know that you can use the leaf color of a plant to tell what nutrient it's short on? It's a fun, fun fact, right? I learned that from my disease book. But your best resources in order are your neighbors. They're your best resource. Imagine if I took you and threw you into Thailand, you're in some rice paddy, totally different climate, totally different food area to totally different habitat, totally different water, like bacteria culture right there. Who are you gonna, who are you gonna talk to? You're gonna go to the library and research it? No, you're just gonna talk to your neighbors that are doing it, right? I talked to my neighbors about 
raising sheep because they raise goats. It's pretty close. All right. Your farmer's co-op says coop there. It should sound like co-op. You have local farmers co-ops all over the place. I even have one in my tiny backwater town of Monterey, Tennessee. Use them, give them a call. If you need something, they also will find you tax breaks possibly. You never know. Everything's very regional. So you're gonna look at those regionally specific books. And then finally your local plant nursery. Your local plant nursery makes their money by keeping you growing plants. So they don't want your plants to just fail. They're gonna give you good information. They also have to deal with keeping their plants alive. Finally, this culminates in better is the enemy of done. So really this whole process of engineering philosophy is about cutting out fluff and focusing on a mission. Everything, every bit of assessment is just to inform your actions so you can get back to the action. It's a very proactive thing. Engineers have no care for what is true or not, right? If a scientist might say, well, how does the helicopter fly? An engineer just says, sweet, this helicopter's flying. Like we don't philosophize really that much. It's curious, but we're more interested in getting paid and getting helicopters to fly than we are with figuring it out. I mean, the theory of flight came decades after we were flying. That's just how it goes. Um, but this better is the enemy of done philosophy uh, problem is a combination of those three, not knowing what your needs are, not knowing how to make a risk assessment and not knowing how to balance research and action, right? Once you conquer all three demons, you're gonna know exactly what done looks like. So better is the enemy of done. What is done? Have you defined what done is? Everyone can define better because we're all brainwashed by marketing from birth because everybody wants better. I want a better car. I want a better, I want a, you know, a better physique. I want a better house. What's a good enough house? What's a done house, right? When are you done? You're gonna have to define when you're done if you ever wanna get there. All right, so getting things done is job number one for sovereignty, 100%. It's maybe a section header. Okay, enough of that. So I've been shouting at you now about engineering philosophy for a little bit, um, but we're gonna show you this process in action. You're gonna be very surprised, but some of this stuff, what the, some of my results were, I was really surprised. That's why I love this job is because once you do the math, you start to find out that ridiculous things can work and then they do, it's amazing. Um, we're also gonna go over having some fun, right? A homestead is a lot of fun. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna, I'm not taking care of all of my needs and then gonna go do stuff that's wants. I'm gonna mix the both of them because I've got some confidence. I also have like two years of food stored away. Uh, so I've got some time, even if my you know, needs, I'm not able to replicate my needs all the time, but you know, next year I'm gonna be raising bees and probably growing shrimp and bamboo and other stuff like that. But you, you'll be surprised at how little you actually need to live on. And it's gonna save you, this presentation is probably gonna save you at least $100,000 on land costs if you thought you needed tons and tons of acreage, right? Um, all right, next slide.